Why don't we go ahead and get started? I've got so many people from across the United States here. Uh, welcome to another Read to Lee Live. I'm your host, Kumara from Read to Lee. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I am so excited about our guest today, Stacey Abrams. I've been reading about, watching, listening, reading your books uh, ever since you ran for governor of Georgia. Adia told me I'd have the honor and privilege of speaking to you on behalf of our youth. I wouldn't have believed it. This is one of those career moments we often discuss on this show. Before we get to our esteemed guests, I just want to talk a little bit about student norms so we make sure that we have a positive experience. Here at Reach Lead, we believe in positive vibes only. We would love to hear from you in the chat, but make sure we keep it positive. No spamming in the chat, but feel free to clap, snap, drop the mic, and engage with us, with us around the things that you hear being said. All right, we want to make sure this is a positive, positive experience. As you guys have questions, you can drop them in the Q&A. And then we'll get to as many questions as we possibly can. Okay, so without further ado, we're here with Stacey. Stacey is the New York Times bestselling author of Our Time Is Now and Lead from the Outside, an entrepreneur and a political leader. She served as Democratic leader of the Georgia House of Representatives for seven years prior to running for governor of Georgia, where she won more votes than any other Democrat in the state's history. She launched Fair Fight Action after the 2018 gubernatorial election to ensure every American has a voice in our election system. Fair Count to ensure accuracy in the 2020 census. And the Southern Economic Advancement Project, a public policy initiative to broaden economic power and build equity in the South. Ms. Abrams has received a degree from Spelman College the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas and Yale Law School. Born in Madison, Wisconsin, she and her five siblings grew up in Gulfport, Mississippi and were raised in Georgia. Stacy, thank you so, so much for being here. We are honored. So I love to start this off by saying and asking you to tell us a fun fact about yourself. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, this is exciting. Probably the fun fact that makes the most sense here is that I actually wrote my first novel when I was 12. It was called The Diary of Angst. I was very unhappy with the world, or so I thought. And my mom kept it for me over 25 years and then gave it to me as a Christmas present one year. She had it bound and given back to me as a Christmas present. So my very first novel, uh, which no one other than my mom and I ever read, it's my fun fact. Oh my God, that is awesome. And I feel like we are kindred spirits. I actually wrote a children's book <laughs> when I was eight and like hole punched it and put it together and illustrated it as a terrible drawing, but illustrated it and then actually gave it off to my friends in elementary school. So that is awesome. There you go. <laughs> uh, so, you know, as you know, we, we mainly serve middle school students. So I would love to know, what did you want to be when you were 10 years old, when you were in middle school? I wanted to do a lot of different things. I, I was one of those kids who had a different ambition every week. My younger sister, Leslie, who's less than a year younger than I am, we were 11 months, 27 days apart. So for three days, she gets to say she's my my age. Uh, she always wanted to be a lawyer. She always wanted to be Thurgood Marshall and become a judge. I wanted to be uh, you know, an actor. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a psychologist. Basically, whatever I saw on PBS the week before, that was going to be my new job. But it helped me realize that I didn't have to pick just one thing. I could imagine being as many things as I wanted. And so far, so good. Man, that's awesome. I think that's so great. You can imagine yourself being whoever you want it to be, right? Um, and so here at Reachly, obviously, we think reading is super fundamental. What books and or authors have been instrumental to your success and or inspiring to you? I was thinking about what book inspired me most when I was younger, and it was actually Helen Keller, The Story of My Life. That's a book about a young woman who faced the most overwhelming odds, blind, deaf, and still managed to not only communicate, but to change the way we think about ability and capacity and leadership. 
I remember reading that when I was really, really young. And it's one of those books I've read again and again, because it reminds me that no matter how daunting or overwhelming or hard things may seem, that we have the capacity to be you know, more innovative and to be smarter than we think we are. And one of the most important pieces of, of the lessons that she drew on was that the, the way we are told to see the world, the way we're told to experience the world, that's a beginning place. That's not the end. And it's up to each of us to figure out how we can experience and change and create progress in our own fashion. I love that you brought up Helen Keller. I haven't thought about her in so long. She's absolutely an inspiring story and historical figure. If you guys have not read her story, please, uh, someone in my team, drop it into the chat. We must absolutely read Helen Keller and really think about the, the lessons that uh, happen when you have some sort of challenge or failure and what you can do and take from that. Actually, I think this is a great lead for us to talk a little bit about how you experience failures and challenges and how you overcome that in your own life. So I failed a lot, but my, my dad, when I was growing up, my father used to tell us, never tell yourself no, let somebody else do it. And what he wanted us to understand is that we only succeed by trying, but we're not guaranteed victory. We are guaranteed opportunity. And so for me, the, it's trying things that I might or might not be good at. It's trying things that might embarrass me if I'm not successful. But what I've learned is that embarrassing yourself isn't permanent. I mean, with, with the internet, it feels like it is sometimes, but it really isn't. And when you, when you take a risk, when you face a challenge, when you try things that are hard, you may not be successful in achieving your outcome, but we always learn something. We learn something about ourselves. We learn something about the field or the area we were trying to succeed in. We learn from what the winners and successful people do, but we can also learn from other folks who don't succeed. One thing I've always tried to do is make sure I understand what I could have done better, what the other, other person could have done, and also to understand whether the system itself makes sense. Most of the time, yeah, it does, but there's sometimes when the system needs to be questioned. And when that happens, it's about being courageous enough to raise your hand and say, they, this may not be the right way to do it. And you may not have the answer, but sometimes the most courageous and most successful thing you can do is to ask the question. I love that. It actually goes to my shirt says, be courageous. And that is awesome, right? To be able to um, just try, even if you don't know if you're gonna succeed because you're going to learn something. Be courageous to just be, ask questions, have some vulnerability. That's great. Thank you so much for that, Stacey. So that leads me to my next question, which is, what does leadership mean to you? I think often we are told that leadership means being in charge, but that's the easiest part. It's easy to be in charge when you're the only person there. Leadership is when you can get other people to share your ideas, to share your vision, to understand what you want to achieve, and they're willing to work to help you get there. If you're doing it by yourself, or if everyone is disagreeing with you, doesn't mean you're not right, but it does mean you're not necessarily leading. Leading happens when you can create a space for people to think that they can collaborate with you. And sometimes leading is about not having your idea be the one that they follow. Sometimes the best leaders are the ones who get other people to speak up, get other people to advance their ideas. And the leader is the person who gets the focus on that idea. It's the person who helps keep the trains moving and keep the traffic moving. I think we sometimes have a very narrow definition of leadership where we think that the only person who can be the leader is the person who's good at talking to people, person who really enjoys being on stage. But sometimes the best leaders are the quiet people and we know who they are. The ones who, if they say something, you nod and you think, yeah, I, I like what that person is saying. Or it's the person who finds the quietest person in the room and makes it safe for that person to be heard. The most important piece about leadership is that we, we will see it in different ways and different people, but the most effective way to be a leader is to make certain that other people are willing to trust you with their dreams and to trust you to do the things that they think will make success possible. 
I love that. I love the idea of being able to create safe spaces where people can trust in you and you can trust in them. And somehow there's some beautiful synergy and relationship building there. So I love the fact that you said, you know, we can have an arrow view of leadership. And oftentimes youngsters are thought like, man, I can't really be a leader until I'm an adult, uh, whatever that means, right? So how can students at home or in class show, embrace their leadership now? Well, I would say to anyone who has siblings, you can be a leader at any point, especially if you're older, but sometimes even when you're younger. Uh, if you don't have siblings, if you have friends, we all find ourselves having leadership moments. But what's so important is to remember that leading is about finding a way to make things better. Those are true leaders. If you're working on making things worse for people, you probably are a super villain and I would stop. But otherwise, being a leader is about understanding how you can help improve things. And anyone can do that. What's most important is figuring out the things that bother you. What are the things that seem unfair? Where are the places where you think we can do better, we can help more people? Those are the places where you can lead. And, and part of it is contributing using your skills. So if you're a writer, maybe you can write something about it. If you're really good at speaking, if you're good at singing, if you're good at strategizing, if you can figure out how to get other people to move around, figure out what your skills are. What's the thing that you do better than anyone else? That's how you can lead. Because the most successful changes, the most successful progress happens when people take their skills and put them together. And when you think that you are too young, too small, too quiet, too different, that just means you are young enough that you haven't learned all the bad ideas. You are small enough that they may not be able to see you coming. And if you're different, they're not gonna pay that much attention. And that means that they're gonna underestimate you and you can get more done. I love that. I gotta, I gotta get some snaps to that. That was beautifully said. So now we're gonna get to some of our student questions and there are hundreds. We'll try to get to as many as we possibly can in the next 15 or so minutes. Okay. so. What was your child look, childhood like? And did you have any role models? I am the second of six children and we range, we're 12 years apart from the youngest to the oldest. I'm number two. And so I grew up with five of my best friends. My older sister is three years older. My younger sister, I have a sister who's a year younger. My brothers were three and five years younger. And then my youngest sister was eight years younger than I am. And so that meant I grew up surrounded by people that I, I knew and loved, and we cared for each other. We had three jobs in my family. My mom and dad told us we had to go to church because th our faith was important. They wanted us to have a belief in something that was bigger than ourselves. And so it doesn't really matter what your faith tradition is. For them, it was just making sure we were never so self-centered that we forgot about the larger world. And But they also taught us to respect other people's faiths, whether they have faith or not. Number two, they made sure we went to school. My mom and dad were both first in their family. My mom was the first person in her family to finish high school. And she was the only one of her seven sisters and brothers to finish. My dad was the first man in his family to go to college. And he had a learning difference. He, he had dyslexia and no one understood what it was. So they just told him he wasn't that smart. And he memorized his way through school. So they were very, very intent about us being not just good in school, but appreciating what education could do. And then the third was that they told us we needed to help others. And that meant, they, they, my mom would say, you're supposed to take care of each other. And that meant not only taking care of my brothers and sisters, but helping volunteers. So we worked at soup kitchens and homeless shelters. We went to nursing homes. We used to go to jails, especially where young people were being incarcerated because they wanted us to help bring not just community, but they wanted people to know they weren't forgotten. And so I grew up really surrounded by people I loved and my role models are my parents. Even to this day, they're two of the best people I've ever known. I love that. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that childhood really has influenced what you're doing in the world today? My mom and dad told us, you know, my mom, my dad would say, my mom said, no matter how little we have, there's someone with less. Your job is to serve that person. Now, we lived in a house, we lived in the suburbs, we're not even in the suburbs, we live in this, yeah, in basically the suburbs in Mississippi. And sometimes we didn't have running water in the house. Sometimes the lights got cut off. My mother would call that urban camping. Uh, basically, she, she meant we were poor. 
but when they would wake us up on Saturday and take us out to volunteer, we would say, you, you guys do know we don't have any money and we don't know what we're, what we're eating tomorrow. And my mom would say, no matter how little we have, there's someone with less, your job is to serve. My dad was even more straightforward. My dad said, having nothing is not an excuse for doing nothing. And they wanted us to understand that if we saw problems, we were responsible for trying to fix them. They didn't think we had to have the solutions, but we had to try. And that's basically been my life. I've spent every day of my life trying to make things better. Sometimes I succeed, sometimes I fail, but I never stop trying because as long as I think I'm doing the right thing, as long as I'm willing to learn and to try to help people, not hurt people, then I think I'm doing the right thing. And that's led me to being a writer, to being a politician. I've been called an activist. I've started small businesses. I've gotten to do all of these different things. I'm a lawyer by training. And every piece of it is how I try to find a way to help others and to you know, know that even if I don't have a lot, I can do a lot more. That really resonates with me. Having nothing is no excuse to do nothing. We need to pop that in the chat so that we can really internalize that word. I have a question from Jada. She wants to know, was it difficult for you as a woman to achieve your goals? Yes. <laughs> so so there, there are two parts to it. And, and I talk about both of them because especially for women of color, for girls of color, you're a girl which means people think of you differently and sometimes think you don't have the skills you have. And if you're a person of color, they underestimate you or treat you differently. And if you are a girl of color, it's even harder sometimes. One of the things that my, my mom and my dad taught me, they would, they, my dad was the first feminist, the, the, the phrase that we use to describe someone who believes that women are just as powerful and just as capable. My dad was the one who really was the first person who, who talked about it explicitly. He would say that, you know, we were just as capable of anything we wanted to do. And he never saw a difference between us and my, my sisters and my brothers, uh, except when it came to taking out the trash, we were able to make my brothers do that more often just because they didn't mind gross stuff. But overall, my parents wanted us to understand that being a girl and that being black didn't make me less than, it might make me different. And often those differences make it harder sometimes for people to hear me. I would have to think about the fact that even though I'm not responsible for other people's prejudices and their bigotry, I am responsible for making sure I do my best. And so I don't assume people are going to think less of me because I'm a girl or because I'm black, but I prepare for it. So I don't get surprised by it. And some of that is by saying it up front. When you hear something that sounds wrong, when you hear something that sounds like an insult, but they like to pretend it's not, you can't just let it stay there. You don't have to be angry about it, but you do have to be assertive about it. I, the one quick example I'll give you is that when I first became the leader, I, I became the person in charge of all of the Democrats in my political party when I was in the state legislature. I was the first woman to be in charge of a political party in the history of Georgia. In 240 years, it had never happened. And the men were kind of freaked out. And there were some men who thought I couldn't possibly do the job because I was a girl and because everyone else who was in charge was usually a guy. And then there's another group of people who thought because I was the first black person to do it in my chamber in the, the part of the government I was in, that that would be hard. And then they were all convinced that because I was a black woman, and younger than a lot of them, that it was gonna to be too difficult. So I did my homework. I made sure I understood who was in charge. I learned about them and I listened. And part of my strategy is that when you listen more than you talk, you learn a lot of things that people don't necessarily think about. And later on, as I needed to, whenever I would face discrimination, I could point to something that I heard or that I knew that they didn't expect me to know because they were so busy thinking about my race and my gender, they forgot that I had I was smart enough to be in charge. Listening is indeed a superpower. I saw someone write that into the chat. So I just wanted to call that out. That's awesome. Um, so do you have any tips for aspiring writers? One, write. We, we like to think about what we want to say, but we get scared. We get scared of how long it takes to write it down or that it's not good enough that it doesn't sound like the best writers that we've read. 
And what we have to understand about writing is that we always get better at writing. What I wrote when I was 12 was really good. I actually read it a few weeks ago. It wasn't bad, but I'm a better writer now because I kept practicing. But the other part is that writing is about telling the stories inside of you. They've got to come out. And so if you've got a story that needs to be told, sometimes you just need to tell it to yourself. Sometimes you want to tell it to the world. And most of us want to be somewhere in between. But if you don't let yourself be honest and tell your story, then how can you be honest with yourself about the other parts of you? Writing is a way to communicate not only with others, it's a way to communicate with yourself. Because sometimes we know things, but we don't want to admit it. Or we're thinking things, but we can't quite figure out how it fits together. Those times when we get tongue tied or when we know we've got this idea and we can't figure out how to make it make sense. Writing is sometimes the best way to solve the puzzle because when you get all the ideas out of your head and on a piece of paper, you can see it and you can start rearranging it like solving a jigsaw puzzle, like solving a riddle. But it's the best way to give yourself more space to really understand what you intend. But the most important thing is don't worry about whether it's great or good or not that great. The most important thing is that you did it because the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. Thank you so much for that, Stacey. I never thought about writing as a way to communicate with myself, but that is so beautifully well said. Um, so thank you for that. So what do you think is the most important thing for middle schoolers to learn? That you are powerful. So often we wait until we're grown up to think that we can have power. And, and I wanna talk about what power is. Power is the ability to influence. It's the ability to compel things to change. And sometimes those changes are small changes. Sometimes those changes are you know, medium sized. They, they can affect a few people. And some of them are, are life altering changes. But we each have the power to be an influencer. We have the power to call out things that we think are not fair. We have the ability to protect people who sometimes seem vulnerable. One of my, when I was in uh, fourth, third and fourth grade, there was a young girl in my class who was from, she, she and her family had immigrated from Vietnam. And for me, it was just about being nice. Plus I was really tall and she was really tiny. And so when bullies would try to pick on her, I would stand up for her. But as she was also trying to learn English, I would, we would sit together at lunch and at recess and we'd work on her English. Well, years and years later, she sent me a note telling me that she is a teacher now in Hawaii and that she remembered the fact that I was, I stood up for her, that I was her most powerful friend. And I never thought about it as a, about being powerful, but when we stand up for others, when we do those small things, like speaking up when we hear someone being bullied, telling a teacher or an, an educator when we know something is wrong, when we encourage our friends to do things they're afraid of, those are all examples of power. Power isn't just about the big things that we see on television or on YouTube videos. Power is about the ability to influence and make change. And you are incredibly powerful because the world you live in and the world you create by who you are is the world the rest of us will inherit. And so I want middle schoolers to understand you're incredibly powerful. And if you don't think you are, just think about the fact they have whole buildings for no one but you. That means you're powerful. They need you to be in the place to learn a bunch of stuff because we know what you're capable of. Oh yeah, so you guys are absolutely so powerful. Just who you are as human beings, the world that you're creating, thinking about the things that you're passionate about, your imagination, going out and trying things. So I wanted to, we have a question from a student. When you enter the world of politics, which problem did you try to first tackle and how did you solve it, if it's been solved? I'm different than a lot of folks who go into politics. I've never believed that I can actually solve the problem that makes me do this work. And that problem is poverty. I think poverty is mean. I think it is immoral. I think it keeps people from being as strong and as capable as they could be. I think sometimes it's used to convince people that they're not worth anything. It's used to block you from learning and it can stop you from trying. And I think it's a waste of human capital. It, it is 
it is one of the most immoral things I, I can imagine. And having grown up in a community where I had these two amazing parents who despite our poverty worked to create this world for me, I realized not everyone's gonna have my mom and dad. And so I went into politics because I wanna create for others what my parents helped to create for me. I don't think I'm ever going to fix everything because just as much as I believe that we should make things more equitable and create more access, there are those who believe that their only ability to be powerful requires that people have less, requires that people be impoverished, requires that there be harm. There are good people and there are people who do mean, spiteful, petty things. They're not gonna go away just because I do my job. They're not going to stop making decisions that make things harder just because I fight to make things easier. And so my belief isn't that I'm going to always win, but what's going to terrify them and make me stronger is that I never stop trying. And for me, politics is about how can I fix those problems, not solve them permanently, but how can I fix them so that for every person, things get a little bit better, that every time I do something, I'm making it easier for other people to be the best that they can be. Man, that's great. Thank you. That was so powerful as well. Like, I could say so much about poverty, like offline at some point in time, but I just love the idea that we're just going to keep trying. You have a mission, you have a vision, you have a passion, and you know that as long as you try, there's no such thing as truly failing. You're learning something. Um, you're learning something about yourself. You're learning something about the world. You can lead. You all are indeed powerful. I'm going to switch gears and go to something a little bit more fun or a little lighter, I should say. Someone wants to know if you have a favorite sport, <laughs> what is it? And who's your favorite team, sports team? See, I, I like sports. I love basketball. I love football. I will watch baseball, but it takes a long time. Uh, <laughs> so, but I, I grew up liking different teams because I grew up in Mississippi. We didn't have our own sports team. So I became a fan of multiple teams, but I'm also in Georgia. So by law, I think I'm required to say the Hawks and the Falcons, uh, <laughs> but they are both doing really well. So those are two really good teams, but I don't have an absolute favorite team. I, I really like good players and I like people who care about their sport, care about their craft and are willing to work hard to be successful. Great. So before we leave, and again, Stacey, thank you so much for being here with us. What advice would you give your 10-year-old self? I would tell my 10-year-old self that I'm not as clumsy as I think. I'm not as awkward as I feel. That I am smarter than I know. And there's going to be a moment where all of those pieces make me a better person than I could have imagined. Thank you so much for being here, Stacey. You have said so many powerful words in these last 30 minutes. I know this is a great way for us to end the school year with our students. They've got something intangible that they can bring to themselves as they walk through the world, as they think through their passions, as they try, as they learn, as they find their voice, as they communicate through writing. Thank you so much for ending our Read to Lead season. We are so excited to have had you here. Thank you. Stacey, I can't believe it. <laughs> Pinch me a little bit. <laughs> it's been my honor. And thank you, Kamara, for having me. It's such a pleasure.